has been an influential force on the vibraphone. The Burton grip, the technique he invented to play pianistically with four mallets, bears his name. He's also an important figure in jazz education through a 33-year affiliation with the Berklee College of Music in Boston. As a band leader, he made what is arguably the first jazz fusion album in the 1960s and has since mentored many artists, including guitarists Pat Metheny and Julian Logg. He also mentored composers such as Michael Gibbs, Steve Swallow, and Carla Bley, recording their music on many of his successful albums. His long collaborative history with the pianist Chick Corea resulted in six Grammys and are regarded as one of the highest examples of the jazz duet. In 2016, Gary Burton was recognized as a National Endowment for the Arts Jazz Master, the highest honor reserved for a jazz musician. But for me, I'll always be grateful to have had him as a teacher when I was a student at the Berklee College of Music from 1971 to 1975. As you're about to hear, Gary explains things extremely clearly so that information that is new and sophisticated seems logical and inevitable. He was also very encouraging to me as a composer, and we spent many happy sessions looking at my tunes and discussing all the possibilities. In 2004, I wrote and hosted a radio series for the BBC called Inside Improvisation. Enjoy my interview now with the great Gary Burton. It's really easy to, to explain improvisation to musicians, but yeah. to try to explain what it is to non-musicians takes a little more, uh, you know, cleverness and fun. I know. I've done both, explaining it to musicians and trying to explain it to uh, non-musicians, and it's, it calls for a whole different uh, vocabulary. Yeah, That's and I have to say, you are the guy who explained absolutely everything so so fantastically <laughs> to me when I was a mere young pup uh, uh -huh. that I, uh, I'm very happy that you're going to help me in this great uh, Good. task. Well, I'm, I'll do what I can. If you had to explain improvisation to a non-musician, how would you go about it? Well, I usually start, even with musicians, by making analogies uh, as much as possible to speaking because the same functions of the brain seem to apply to both experiences. You know, when we talk, we don't think about nouns and verbs and things as we make our sentences. We uh, just think of the point we want to express or the what we have in our mind's eye that we want to put into words. And sort of miraculously, the sentences get formed in our unconscious and come tumbling out uh, about the same split second that we picture the, the words, we speak them. It's very spontaneous. And uh, the same thing happens when we're improvising. There's kind of a vocabulary uh, that applies to music and a grammar and so on. And we've learned the rules and we've assimilated them. And the same thing happens. We see the circumstances, certain harmonies that we're playing over and certain musical elements. And we kind of turn to our unconscious, which gives us a musical sentence, a phrase, a melodic phrase. And who knows what goes on to make it come out logical and and fit, uh, you know, with the words in the right order and the notes in the right order sort of thing. But it seems to work. And, you know, and as any musician will tell you, when they actually are improvising, you know, they're not thinking about it. They're mm -hmm. not saying, well, which note should I play next? Or uh, any more than when we speak, you know, where should I put the verb in this sentence? Um, it, the unconscious sort of takes care of organizing the data and and giving it to us in a very spontaneous, flowing way. Yeah, this sounds uh, very much... I remember you talking uh, rather eloquently in the old days about this concept of idiokinetics, and uh, mm -hmm. I, I thought that that, kind of, that that very much relates to what you were just saying. Yeah, that book, which was called New Pathways to Piano Technique, was very influential in my thinking. I mean, most of us learn to improvise 
uh, through the natural processes of learning music, and we don't really break it down and analyze how how it is we're doing it or how it works. It just seems to work, and the more you do it, the the smoother you get at it. Just like learning a new language or learning how to speak, mm. uh, you know, effectively. Uh, but that book, which wasn't even about improvisation, it was about the fact that we play music relying very heavily on the unconscious part of the brain that has assimilated all this information and then it gives it to us you know, in rapid fire order faster than we could consciously think of all the pieces of information and get them organized. You know, when you see somebody playing a fabulous, challenging concerto on the violin or something, you know, you know they're not thinking of each note one at a time. Mm. Uh, they're they're on uh, a different kind of wavelength at that point, and you know, they're all the musicianship that they've assimilated is now uh, in charge of of the playing. And in fact, you know, I think most musicians will tell you that when they're in the actual act of playing, it feels like almost someone else is doing the playing. You're <laughs> watching it happen. And you hear the, the music coming out and you see it happening, but uh, you don't feel like you're really making all those choices and decisions and, and guiding exactly what's going to happen. You're, you're using your, you know, this automated process of instincts that you've built up over the years to do it for you. Hmm. Now, um, going on with the analogy of speech, um, some solos, I would put forward uh, the idea that some solos are like a conversation because obviously you're conversing with the other musicians in in a kind of way. There's a dialogue, mm-hmm. That's and, right. and yet and yet some solos are kind of more like you're making a speech or you're testifying in church or you're you know. I mean, there's a difference between those two types of playing. Very much so, and in fact, sometimes I describe to um, people the difference between playing a solo piece by myself or playing a duet piece with one other musician or playing in a band. Hmm. And, and working in reverse order, playing in a band is like being part of a panel discussion. <laughs> uh, everyone takes turns giving their perspective on the topic, on the subject, and the rest of us on the panel kind of encourage them with, you know, that's what the accompanists are doing. They're saying, yeah, oh, do more. That's, that's a good point. Uh, keep, keep going. We're trying to help them get their, uh, you know, little speech done. Mm. And when you're playing a duet with someone, it's like a one-on-one conversation. I, I consider duets one of the most exciting formats uh, in performing because uh, it's much more intense. Uh, in a conversation, um, you know, you say something and the person opposite you says something back and then you, you say something. And so it's, you know, you, you have to wait for each other to speak and respond. With music, it's on a higher level. You both get to talk at the same time hmm. and converse back and forth. But you don't have to stop and wait for the other person to answer. You could get to keep playing at the same time. So it's much more interactive. And because there's only two musicians doing it, uh, it feels like one of those great conversations you have with your best friend where you know each other so well that you can almost jump ahead to what to what they're going to say next because, you know, you you are so familiar with their uh, ideas and their thoughts and, and their personality. So I love that setting. Mm. And as you say, playing solo com- alone is uh, is like giving a speech. You, you, you know, plan the whole – you don't plan it, but you conceive the whole thing uh, as an expression aimed from you to the audience and you're solely responsible for – making it happen. So those three settings each have a very different dynamic for the performer and steer us in, in, you know, into different ways of, uh, of shaping our improvising. Well, now, um, tell us how your improvising is shaped by the different uh, people who you improvise with. Now, you've very famously done uh, fabulous duets with a number of different magnificent creative players, but also players who are uh, contrasting with each other. I mean, for instance, you know, you've played with Stefan Grappelli and you've also played with uh, uh, Chick Corea. So, I mean, Mm -hmm. can you give a little idea of how you might, uh, how your improvising might change talking to these different people or playing with these different people? Yeah, sure. It's it's really similar to what happens uh, when you have, uh, you know, conversations with two very different people. 
and you're, you're listening to what they're saying and, you know, and the conversation goes a certain direction. So if I was having a conversation with Stefan Grappelli, for instance, he's a, he was, until he passed away, an, an elegant, elderly French individual with a very European perspective and sensibility. He was fun to talk to and reminisce with stories about his early career and so on. On the other hand, if I'm having a conversation with Chick, it's much more intense and focused. I mean, this is a musician who never stops for a minute. He's always got four different bands underway and three different record projects he's developing, and he's full of of energy and ideas and so on. So the, naturally, a conversation with each of those people would go in different directions. And the same thing happens when you play with them. You react to the melodic phrases and rhythmic style that that they have in their playing and of course they're reacting to yours as well so you find a rapport that's uh, a different kind of experience with each individual you play with sometimes it's a really inspiring rapport and i would say that certainly has been true with uh, with me and and chick over what 32 years we've been playing together Mm. now and uh and i've had that with some other musicians as well on the other hand, I've played with some f- folks who um, it's nice. We seem to be able to play comfortably together, but I don't feel nearly as inspired. Mm. And I say, okay, well, this is a situation where this player and I, you know, uh, don't relate as much to each other's styles and each other's uh, musical identities, even though we can certainly uh, play comfortably together. Not as many sparks are flying and, and so on. And, uh, and you keep coming back to the players that really inspire you, of course. Well, now, speaking of styles, you also have inspired yourself by uh, experimenting with uh, improvising in non-jazz styles such as tango and also classical music uh, with your Virtuosi al- album. Can you talk mm-hmm. a little bit about your, your thinking and how that affects your playing? Well, I'm kind of a restless spirit, I've decided. I mean, some musicians are very comfortable staying within their most familiar uh, idiom, and they, they're they comfortable making uh, record after record of similar uh, settings and similar instrumentations and similar uh, material. Um, I've always had some itch to keep trying other things. And anytime I hear a kind of music that gets me excited, the first question I ask myself is, there's something I can do here? Can I get involved in this somehow? And and some it works better sometimes than others. I will say my, my experiment with tango music, I was wary of. I, I'd listened to tango for years and loved uh, Astro Piazzolla's music and never imagined myself actually playing it. It seems so uh, such a you know a fully developed kind mm. of music that I said you know I would I would feel like a I was out of place you know a stranger in this music and you know uh, they probably wouldn't be that thrilled with me, me trying to play along with them, but he approached me and said would you know he'd love to try a project with me, so um, I couldn't turn that down when he since he offered. And I was still nervous up to the first couple of rehearsals uh, of the music that he had written because I did, just didn't know uh, how well it would work. It was very different in, in one major sense. When we improvise in jazz, you're normally – you're given the spotlight for a few minutes at a time. You know, now is your solo mm-hmm. and you get to develop uh, melodic themes and, and, and melodic ideas that you introduce and build them into something and – create a climax and then finish and step back and let someone else play. Mm. He didn't have that concept at all for improvising. His idea was that I would play the written music and then there would be these little moments, a measure here, two seconds there, three, you know, three harmonies over here, and he would point them out and say, you know, play something there, <laughs> add something there, do something in that spot. So I had to learn how to play the written music and then go into improvising for what might be five seconds or even as long as 10 seconds and then go back into the written part mm. and make it sound, you know, like it was all intentional and and uh, and, and, and flowed. 
And at first, that was that was awkward. I was used to soloing, you know, having the floor for a while and getting to, you know, take my time developing something and saying something you know, musically that was my own. This was meant really getting into his music and figuring out how to embellish on it and how to add to it without you know, stepping out uh, completely on my own. But I loved the experience, and mm. it changed in many ways my uh, whole perspective on what it means to improvise and what it means to um, go into another form of music, another style of music that's new to you. I, mean, I really, I think it um, made me bolder about trying other kinds of music. Mm. Well, you, you certainly got over your nervousness about it. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, that's great. Um, let's now put you, you're a teenage guy, and you pick up the mallets, and uh, you revolutionized the way that your instrument was seen from then on. After, you know, it, people can't think of the vibraphone without starting by thinking about you. Now, how did if you can give an impression of how that occurred to you when you were a teenage kid uh, to do that. Well, that was almost a result of the circumstances I found myself in um, as a young musician. I grew up in a farm town in Indiana. Most of the time, no other musicians to play with. Hmm. And I played alone a lot. And there was also a piano in the house because my older sister uh, had taken piano lessons. And since the keyboard of the vibraphone and the keyboard of the piano are the same, you know, most vibes players kind of pick around on the piano and pick out tunes and, and fumble around and play the piano some as well. And so I started doing this too. And increasingly, I, I felt that playing the vibraphone by myself was too empty. To, it wasn't complete enough. I needed harmony. I needed it, the music to sound uh, like it could stand on its own. So uh, even though at first it seemed impractical to play with four mallets in a continuous way, I just sort of kept messing around with it, and just by that time I was, what, age 13, 14, 15 or so, and getting more and more interested in jazz, and developing this uh, pianistic keyboard approach to the vibraphone. And, and by the time I really was exposed to other musicians, when I left high school and uh, came east to Boston to go to college, I had essentially established this style for myself. And it still had some years of development to go through, but I had sort of carved out what was my identity as a player really because of, you know, how I spent my teen years uh, kind of in isolation. Mm -hmm. Well, a musician obviously needs to develop their own voice, and you, you started out right away by having a recognizable uh, uh, Gary Burton sound by using four mallets, but you also had some other things that you did. Uh, you you kind of refused to use the motor that was a kind of a, a, a typical sound got, of the vibes up to that time. And I got that from George Shearing. Hmm. The f first band I played with as a steady job after I left school was uh, George's quintet. And he, part of his, his sound was this lush, uh, unison uh, piano, guitar, and vibes. Mm -hmm. And he requested no motor. Hmm. And I said, well, okay, fine. It's, your, it's his band. And uh, I was thrilled to have a job. And, you know, that was the least of my concerns was <laughs> whether the vibrato was on or not. <laughs> and I played with him for a year. And then uh, and I then switched over to playing with Stan Getz for several years. And at first, I turned the motor back on again. Hmm. And it bothered me. It annoyed hmm. me. I had gotten used to it being off. So after about a week, I just turned it off again. Hmm. And, and that became... Uh, what it just felt more right to me. Uh, I, I don't, didn't think the instrument needed the vibrato effect. To be honest, I think it sounds great when I listen to Milt Jackson, for instance. Uh -huh. It's really part of his sound and his melodic style. For a four mallet player that's playing more intricate voicings and contrapuntal lines occasionally and so on, uh -huh. the vibrato actually gets in your way a little bit. And it's the music comes through more cleanly and uh, easier to hear all the parts yeah. uh, without the vibrato. So I've I've stayed with that, and now 
it's out in the the world of vibraphone players. It's about fifty fifty of players who use it and players who don't. So I guess I've had some same with four mallet playing. A lot of players do play with four mallets now, and I'm sure that's you know those things have been you know part of my influence on the instrument. Mm. You also came up with another little technique, which is uh, one of your little trademarks, which is the note bending thing. Oh yeah. Although I uh, haven't heard you do it too much of late, but but you know, that, I, was, I, that was a hip little right. thing you used to do. Uh, you know, I didn't invent it. Okay. It was shown to me by a studio uh, musician in in L.A. His name is Emil Richards, uh -huh. and he showed it to me one day. I was in my early twenties then, and he showed it to me by using a cigarette lighter. Uh, on the bar to to make this uh, effect happen, where the you'd hit the note and then it would drop in pitch the way a you know a horn or a guitar might slide downward, and uh, and it was really attractive to me as a player of an instrument that has a fixed keyboard, the idea of being able to bend a note occasionally for. Uh, expression was seemed like a really uh, great idea, hmm. and I I couldn't imagine how to do it on, on the gig with a cigarette lighter though. Yeah. So I figured out I could do the same effect if I used a hard uh, xylophone mallet uh -huh. instead and held that in my hand along with my regular mallets, and then when I wanted to have this bent note effect, I could bring the hard mallet up and. Uh, press it on the bar in the right spot and and make this effect happen. I used it kind of regularly for, I don't know, five, ten years or so. And then in the middle of a tour, I was in Europe at the time, I broke that mallet <laughs> in, the, in the middle of a concert. I didn't have an extra one. And we were traveling around. I said, well, I've got another like, eight concerts to go before we go home. I'll just do without it. And, you know, I didn't miss it. Hmm. Uh, by the end of the tour, I did. I, I just said, well, you know, maybe I'll get another one and do it again, and maybe I won't. And I just never did hmm. again. I, I, I don't. I can't really say why I lost interest in it. Um, I just didn't seem to need it anymore. Yeah. Well, I mean, obviously, it would suit certain tunes, and it would yeah, not suit others. That's other right. Tunes. And, and I didn't use it on every song. Certainly, it yeah. was it was on on a, on certain songs. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it also brings me to something that I think is. Uh, really interesting about a musician developing their own voice uh, uh, as a player and improviser, which is that the instrument uh, physically, if you think about a vibraphone, you hit the thing and it rings until mm. you let up the pedal and that's it. And, and yet, even though it's kind of like an on-off kind of thing, just as in some ways a piano is, yeah. Your particular use of dynamics and internal dynamics uh, makes the instrument sing. Now, how did you develop that? Because obviously that is not something that would be physically easy to do. Well, I mean, you hit on it when you said the same thing is true of piano. I took a look at piano players. And I said, well, you know, I can easily tell the difference between Bill Evans and Oscar Peterson and Herbie Hancock and Chick Corea and, and so on. And I said, well, why is that? And in some cases, it was just the, their touch on the instrument. Mm. Some had a harder percussive touch. Some were much more delicate and classical. And then that could be true on the vibes if you use harder mallets or you use softer mallets and so on. But the biggest differences were stylistic you know, um, choices of voicings and choices of melodic phrasing uh, that you, you you tend to recognize when you hear a, a you know a, a strong, well-known pianist perform. And so, I set about just finding my own way of of uh, of playing the instrument. And and you know, it's, this is the toughest thing to to teach, to try to help students with. Everybody who is a music student seems to know that it's important to find their own style and their own voice, but it's the most difficult thing to, to try to explain or give them any sh insights into or any shortcuts to, because it's not like you can say, well, try this or try that, or here, practice these things over and over and you'll have it. Mm. Uh, it it's, it's just like, you know, it's really part in a way of our personality. And it's very hard to um, change your personality. It's something that evolves, you know, kind of uh, under the surface as we mature, and we don't have a lot of control over it. Uh, sometimes I compare this to, uh, again, to talking. You know, everybody can talk, and yet some people are far more interesting talkers <laughs> than others. 
And some people have a much more uh, effective delivery. They speak better. They speak more clearly. Their voice and enunciation is is so so good. They end up you know speaking on the radio. Who knows why it turns out that some people are more uh, effective at speaking in both their choice of words and the way they express it than someone else. We can all talk, but there is a difference. And it's sort of the same with, um, with, you know, with musicians. Uh, sometimes the style that you end up having as your own just isn't that unique, doesn't stand out uh, from the other players on, of your instrument, and so you don't get as much attention for originality. And other times, your playing happens to be, you know, very clearly original and unique, and uh, you benefit from it. But we don't have a lot of control over it. Mm. I spoke to you about this before, about who actually made the first Fusion album, and we decided it was you. Uh, <laughs> by about, okay. I think you, you preceded Miles Davis by about a month, so we decided... No, that, actually, okay. it was, about was two it? or three years. Oh, two or three years. Okay, fine. I started playing what's now called Fusion in 1967, and uh, Bitches Brew was in 1970, which was Miles' uh, foray into the field. Okay. So actually, I had a couple of years head start. Well, you the man. But the thing <laughs> is, <laughs> the thing is, I, I think it's really interesting that a lot of people think of improvisation, and they, they think of jazz, you know, and they think, well, that's what improvisation uh, is. But yet there are other types of music that you've been interested in, and you've, uh, ro- you've done rock, you've done blues, you've been interested in country music. Can you say something about improvisers in those styles and what you've particularly gotten from them? Well, there's a history of improvising in some musics. Indian music, for instance, uh, is a very big element in there. And even country music, which was, I grew up surrounded by country music and actually started my professional career in Nashville because that was near, near where I was living as a teenager. We don't tend to think of uh, country musicians being improvisers, but if you listen to the instrumental country music, bluegrass music, you'll hear some really hot soloing by you know, guitar players, banjo players, violinists, and so on. And in fact, I discovered that a lot of country musicians are pretty big jazz fans because they're relating to this same thing of taking a solo and uh, doing you know some creative improvising on it. The main difference between the improvising in country music and in jazz music is the harmonies are more complex and uh, more dissonant in uh, in jazz music, and the structures of the pieces are are less familiar and predictable. But the instrumental uh, virtuosity and and excitement of soloing, you know, are are common to both of those musics. There was also improvising, of course, in classical music during the Baroque era. It was, you know, considered uh, kind of an expectation. You know, on the Virtuosi record, Makoto Ozone and I recorded a, uh, a Scarlatti sonata, and the instructions are, you know, you play each of the sections twice, and the second time you're supposed to drastically uh, reinvent it. Uh, and in, and supposedly Scarlatti himself was a was a demon keyboard player, mm. and was famous for uh, improvising on his pieces and so on. And keep in mind, he was born the same year as Bach. They were the same, you know, of the same generation. So that was a golden era of improvising in classical music. And for some reason, it faded away. And now the classical musicians today sometimes will say to me, God, I wish I could improvise. I wish I know how to take a solo and, and everything. Uh, can you tell me how it works? Uh, what do you do? What, what should I do? And, um, and it's hard for them after having played only written music for – you know, 20, 30 years to suddenly try to spontaneously make up music. It'd be almost as if, uh, and it could never happen in real terms, but it'd be as if you learned the English language only reading a part, reading a script, Hmm. and then suddenly said, okay, now I'm going to just talk spontaneously. Uh, Where do I start? How do Hmm. I do this? Uh, Where's my, I need something to read, you know, to know what to do. Um, Asking an actor to do that if he's only used to doing uh, scripted plays. Uh, yeah, there you go. In fact, I, people ask me sometimes, you know, uh, f- again for analogies, and I say the stand-up comedian is the closest 
to the jazz improviser. Uh, you have a sort of a, a general routine of, of comments and remarks and topics to talk about and jokes to tell, and you pace them uniquely each performance. You add things spontaneously if it pops into your mind. You go off in tangents occasionally if something occurs to you during the performance. Uh, you don't stick exactly to uh, the prepared script, but you do have at least a general model in mind as you start you know, your, uh, your comedy routines. And that's what it feels like as a jazz improviser. We have our songs, and we've played them before, and our solo isn't going to be drastically different from night to night, but it's going to be nonetheless less, you know, slightly different and uniquely crafted for each situation, each audience. Mm. And uh, so to me, I, I feel there's a, there's a very close correlation there. Can you name or talk about perhaps one improviser? I mean, I'm sure there are many, many, many improvisers who you could discuss in great detail, but just take one person, for instance, and talk a little bit about why you personally were affected by hearing them and how you might have been influenced by them when you were, you know, developing your style. Okay. Why don't I, in fact, say something briefly about three of them? Okay. Because um, they were big influences on me and how I developed my own improv approach to improvisation. One was Bill Evans, who was one of my heroes when I was, uh, you know, late teens and, and about to start college. Uh, Bill was sort of a revolutionary pianist in the late 50s, early 60s, uh, because he changed the rhythmic structure of, of soloing. Uh, we, we sometimes used to re refer to it as playing across the bar lines. Instead of the, the melody phrases being very uh, predictably in two and four bar phrases and so on, his would ex seem to extend beyond where you expected them to stop, and they would start again in a place where you weren't expecting a new melody to start. And that seemed to be a, a very liberating um, kind of effect to the listener and to the player to feel less, you know, locked into the predictable uh, rhythmic structure and metric structure. And uh, so I, I took that very much to heart. Uh, another player that was a big influence on me is Sonny Rollins, who I consider one of the masters of theme development. Um, you know, we, we want to tell a story when we solo. We want to hold the listener's attention, just like we're, you know, we're a storyteller. And if you do it right, you have the, the, the listener on the edge of their seat, you know, waiting to hear what the next new piece of information is that adds to the story. And you, and you stay focused on this line of continuity. And the solos, the solos that, you know, stand up to the test of time uh, almost always are well-developed thematically and uh, hold the listener's attention, uh, you know, beautifully. And the Sonny Rollins records I used to listen to when I was in high school just knocked me out. He would play these long improvisations that were just, just using these same themes, worked and worked and reworked and extended and developed. You could really hear what he was doing with the music, and I thought that was a great thing to strive for rather than just playing you know, pretty phrases one after another, try to make it really go somewhere and, and take the listener along with you on the trip. Mm -hmm. And the third person I would mention is Miles Davis, who came along at a time when it was fashionable to play a million notes, you know, per bar, mm -hmm. <laughs> I guess is the way I could describe <laughs> it. Uh, musicians had become quite virtuosic by the 60s, and we had players who could, you know, really play their instruments with incredible facility and music that was inc very busy uh, harmonically, lots of chord changes, lots of uh, frenetic activity going on. And it was almost to the point where, you know, it can't get any busier. So what do, what do, where do we go next? And Miles introduced um, a kind of simplicity he started his band playing modal music where there was very little harmonic movement, and he played very sparse but plaintive and, um, and easy to grasp melodic phrases, and there'd be big pauses sometimes between them and creating a lot of suspense and, and mystery to them, and I found that to be uh, another really educational thing. You don't have to fill every beat with as many notes as you can get into it. 
and and he was uh, always a master at uh, playing the very few notes and expressing a tremendous amount with them. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Well, first of all, I think we've got to wrap it up now, but this has been okay. absolutely fantastic. And, well, thanks, uh, Richard. You you more than fulfilled the uh, the gig here. <laughs> okay. Uh, that, that, that. that was great stuff, and you know, I can't thank you enough for doing it. Well, I'm I'm happy to uh, to be taking part. I'm sorry I won't hear it. I mean, we get the BBC over here. No, but you'll hear the... it because we'll send it to you. Oh, I mean, okay. Absolutely, <laughs> you'll you'll get you'll get a copy of the whole thing. When we, I'd, when I'd we love to hear it. what what you know what other people have to say, and also see how you put it together. I mean, this is a fascinating topic. Yeah. And uh, and it, you know, it's, there's no end of things that you can talk about. Pleasure talking to you, Richard. Fantastic, Gary. Talk to you soon, hopefully. Okay. Bye. Bye. Radio Richard.